Uh, I believe the figure was one million uh, per hour. But to her point, it is something that could drain the company the longer this does drag on. Let's get our panel's a reaction uh, to all of this. Uh, we've got Danielle McLaughlin and David Benson. We've got Joseph Pinion. Um, Danielle, if this does drag on, you've seen a lot of the Democratic candidates already pounce that the, 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 the workers should share in the riches, and they haven't been, that they're going to make sure this is a campaign issue, is it? Absolutely. I mean, you think about somebody like a Bernie Sanders or an Elizabeth Warren. Certainly the Democratic Party has been really the pro-union party for as long as unions have been around. You normally want to go after your boss for more money when the boss is doing well. <laughs> this boss is not doing as well, right, David? So the question is that there might be a limit to what Mary Barr, the, the board, can offer. Yes, and you would think that we would have learned this lesson. I mean, the company went through bankruptcy because of the commitments they made that they couldn't keep to pensioners and union demands over a generation. That's exactly what happened economically. It's indisputable. Right now, for Julian Castro to jump into this with that kind of class warfare is so unreasonable. They, to be fair. A lot of those candidates are doing it. Well, that, right? that's yeah. right. That's right. And I think that uh, it will be a campaign issue, but I'm not convinced it's a winning one for the Democrats. Meantime, uh, the fallout here, uh, both domestically in the United States, globally, of course, the Asian markets were hit the hardest on a percentage basis. Of course, they're vulnerable to uh, certainly Saudi oil. Got a lot of Saudi oil, Iranian oil to, to boot, by the way. David, we seem to think of this country, all signs point to Iran. Um, so... Uh, the president has promised some sort of a response, locked and loaded, whatever that means. But what, what do you think it means? Well, I, it's amazing how bold people get when John Bolton's no longer in the administration, I guess. So uh, there's my little yeah, plug for Ambassador the, No, Bolton. he was the one who said, don't trust these guys, don't deal with these guys, don't don't make negotiations. He, he's, he said a lot of things that reflect a lot of wisdom, but uh, he, will, he will be missed for, for some of us. Look, this isn't an economic story primarily. I really agree. By the way, 14% is a big number today. This brings oil to where it was July 10th. Right. And before that, May 24th. We've seen it twice this year when there wasn't a Saudi attack exactly. and so forth. So put, wait, $60 oil is not going to disrupt any global markets. And, and so I think geopolitically, you have to wonder not only how it happened, what the response is going to be. Does it end up forcing the president's hand? You saw this morning Tulsi Galbert kind of uh, po poking at the president a little bit, saying, are you going to do anything about Saudi Arabia and so forth? Um, ultimately, from an economic standpoint, and certainly U.S. economy, this is the whole reason reason why a lot of us have spent a generation saying U.S. needs to be the production leader in the world of oil so that we're not captive to international forces and nefarious actors. Well, I mean, it's interesting that we would refer to President Trump as non-interventionist because I, I think it's been amazing to watch his popularity with, uh, you remember in the campaign, the bomb, the you-know-what out of ISIS rhetoric and the real isolationist or non-interventionist crowd. I, I think he's played both sides of this remarkably well from a political Does standpoint. Does that confuse markets? It confuses yeah. markets. It certainly confuses me. And allies, I would say. And, allies. and it confuses allies and all of that. Yes, the end well, you're result. you're a hater. You like Bolton and you, you were dissing the president. No, it's, not, it's not being a hater. It's more, I, 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 I know, I know. But honestly, it is confusing that we don't know exactly what the ideology is here around foreign policy. David, finally, before we go to break here, market soothsayers uh, always tend to say, uh, be prepared for the black swan development or the, the thing you weren't counting on. Invariably, those come out in the Middle East, not all the time, to be fair. But could something there, something generated now with this, be that? I, I think the whole point of a black swan event is that you don't know what it's going to be. And so all the forecasting, it's made for this sort of cottage industry of right. doom and gloomers and so forth. But ultimately, whenever someone is predicting what the next black swan will be, it's what I always know it will not be. In this case, it's an easy pick to say Middle Eastern geopolitical fragility is a likely candidate to do something because that's sort of better. Well, you are not of that mind. No, I, I'm not at the mind that it's predictable. I'm at the mind that it's potential, but I think there's issues with Russia, issues with China. I think that the European Union economically is the most likely candidate to create a black swan global economic event. But uh, the European banking system is completely insolvent and we don't ever talk about it. Yeah. It's stuff we don't talk about that scares me more than stuff we do talk about. Kind of bumming me up. I know. <laughs> They arrested 127,000 criminals off the streets of this country last year. Not just illegal aliens, those, those that committed crimes against U.S. citizens. Right. And they want this company to stop working with us? Study the issue. If you want change, if you want to affect change, go to the hills of Congress and, and t tell them to make change. 
All right, that's retired ICE director Tom Homan sending a message to protesters now calling on Microsoft to cut ties with ICE and uh, protesting outside Microsoft facilities to hammer home the point. Uh, back with our panel right now to digest this. What do you think, Dave? Well, I'm not a big fan of the IRS, as you might imagine, but I would never advocate that any technology company stop providing software services to the IRS. I think that this is uh, the wrong target. I, I believe that they're handling it on the wrong way, and ultimately this is a tactic that the left has now become, unfortunately, too cozy with. And as I said before, I do consider it a form of cultural Marxism. This is not the way we try to affect change in our country. Danielle? Well, I think actually the way we affect change is by speaking out. I think you think about Vietnam protests, you think about other ways that people have sort of come together and made their voices. But then to heard. advocate boycotting that No, and I do actually think that this is a little bit much. There was an internal letter. I think 300 Microsoft uh, employees supported this uh, exit from ICE last year. That's not a lot of people in the grand scheme of Microsoft employees. I think this is a small fringe group trying to have their say. Actually, the Microsoft uh, products that they are related to calendaring and mail. Yeah, they have nothing to do with these detention facilities. But not, to, not to advocate for, you know, separating children from their parents, but I, I think this is misplaced. Yeah, what do you think? We, we've leapt from a BDS protest led by the left to now a protest of an American government agency. Yeah. Um, and to me, that that is nonsensical. Um, even if your goal is to say that you want ICE to be more sensitive to the cultural needs, you want ICE to be more sensitive to the fact that families are being torn apart, or whatever your talking point of the day is, um, this type of approach only alienates uh, your movement. It actually hampers your ability to get support from people who might intrinsically be willing to agree with you because they're sitting here looking at you say you must have absolutely no idea what you're talking about. And they're also probably using Microsoft products while As they express speak. their disdain. Right, they're writing letters on Microsoft Word. Yeah. But, this know, was at the New York offices, uh, one of the many offices that Microsoft has, these retail offices in Manhattan. I think it was Michael Bloomberg who was had a column in today's New York Post, might have been other papers as well. Uh, warning about this trend. Uh, the former New York mayor billionaire says, you know, you're free to spend your money as you want or not spend it where you want. But uh, that doesn't mean that this lever is, is, is a good idea. No, and actually, if, every, if everything is an outrage, then nothing is an outrage. That's right. So I think it really does empower right, critics. Telling that to my Italian relatives. <laughs> Everything's an outrage. I have relatives who haven't talked to each other in 40 years. They have no oh, idea why. Family. No. Yeah. And, you know, some brands take a stand on social justice. We saw this with Nike and Colin Kaepernick. But not all brands want to do this. And, you know, ultimately, we'll see how this plays out. But I think this is a small fringe. Yeah, yeah we've gone from cultural segmentation to now business segmentation. I think, again, ultimately, all this will end up doing is shuffling the deck. You'll have different people using Microsoft all of a sudden. But it, it goes to, you know, I've seen this, with, whether it's it's talent on this network or talent on other networks. And they say, well, boycott there's a boycott their advertisers. Well, you have the power to turn it off. But I just think that it gets, everyone's hyperventilating. Calm down. Yeah. I, I also think that his point's a really good one. There is a lot of evidence that sometimes boycotts have the opposite effect. Yes. It ends Absolutely. up generating a lot of free publicity for the company. And, Plenty of people are going to be happy, And hardship for others who work there who were just caught up in, in, yeah. in the fray. But let me switch a little bit, guys. The Wall Street Journal is now reporting that Amazon, already the target of a lot of people who want to rein it in for getting too big for its britches, of adjusting their search engine to boost buying their own brand, in other words, Amazon brand. What do you think? Well, you, you might be able to make the argument that there's a vertical antitrust issue here on the one hand. I would never have said that because I don't know what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, anyway, well, but after the show, in their Neil, favor. yeah. But on the other hand, I don't see this as being any different than if you're a store and you have store brand products that you, you place them more prominently. That's because there is no are... difference whatsoever. You're right. exactly right. That's right. exactly what it is. And there's a million things I can crit criticize Amazon for, and we don't own it at my business. We think it's a very expensive stock. However, if they weren't doing that. It would be travesty to their shareholders. Of course you use that position right. to better your economic outcome. But wasn't that the rap with Microsoft years ago that its search and was, was, was favoring or slanted toward Microsoft? Well, later? in theory, by bundling it with their product. And, of course, that, whole, had no choice. that whole antitrust thing was ridiculous as well. But in theory, they were saying you weren't given the choice. But competitive forces changed that. And people have plenty of e-commerce options in the universe. People can go online to shop in a lot of places besides Amazon.